did you hear the story about the man who wrote a letter to the IRS? And he said, Dear Sir, I've been unable to sleep for months because I cheated on my income tax. I understated my taxable income, so I'm enclosing a check for $250. If I still can't sleep, I'll send you the rest of the money. <laughs> Tonight we're going to talk about guilt, and what do you do with guilt? And a lot of us do like that guy does. You try to do the minimum. I just want to sleep at night. And, uh, but is that the right kind of approach? And if you were with us last week, most of you were, but we looked at 2 Samuel 11, and we called it Bathsheba Gate, and we talked about David and Bathsheba. And we, up until that point, we've been studying David for, well, this is lesson 12, so since September, I think we've been on him. And he's been a pretty impressive character, a man after God's heart. Really not much to fault him for, but when he fell, he fell hard. And uh, he did some awful things, really, really bad things. And that's what we talked about last night. He committed adultery with one of his mighty men's wives, Uriah the Hittite. It was one of his buds, his foxhole buddies, that he took his wife. When he couldn't cover up the sin and hide it, he had Uriah killed, murdered on the front line of battle. It's... Um, and then the story closed, and the last line of the 11th chapter said, But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. Let me start by talking about the National Prayer Breakfast in February of 2012. I'm just going to follow my notes here. I almost showed you the prayer breakfast, uh, but it, it's 30 minutes long, and I didn't know how to cut into it. It's Eric Metaxas speaking at the National Prayer Breakfast. Do you know that name, Eric Metaxas? Get to know this name. He, he's making waves. He began his career, if I get it right, by working for VeggieTales, of all things. He's a, a Yale or Harvard graduate. He's obviously upper crust, just the way he carries himself, but he wrote for Veggie Tales, which I just love. But then I first met his name when his book, Amazing Grace, came out, which is the story of uh, William Wilberforce. And it was, of course, made into a movie, the story of uh, the slave trade and the parliament. Then he wrote a huge book that came out about three or four years ago called Bonhoeffer, uh, written and uh, it is a great it's very intimidating because of its size but my daughter even read it and said I couldn't put it down it's got a love story in it he's a very good writer but the life of Bonhoeffer uh, standing up for the Jews and he was a Lutheran pastor when a fellow named Adolf Hitler was elected chancellor of the Third Reich and Bonhoeffer said it's wrong Nazism is wrong and all the other Lutheran pastors said, no, it's not. What's wrong with it? It's good for the economy. It's good for our national pride. What's wrong with Hitler? And Bonhoeffer just said it's wrong. But uh, it's a one. So that's, this is the guy who spoke at the National Prayer Breakfast. Let me, uh, and you can Google this. And in fact, I would encourage you to Google it. And, uh, because he's really a stand-up comedian. He is a riot to listen to. And... But he's on the platform, and right to his right is Michelle and Barack Obama. To his left is Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi. And in front of him are 4,000 people. And he's the speaker for the National Prayer Breakfast. This is now four years ago. Speaking before 4,000 people with President and Mrs. Obama, Vice President Biden, and Speaker of the House Pelosi seated behind him on the platform, Eric Metaxas, had the audacity to confront the leaders of government with their sin. But rather than making a frontal assault, 
He didn't stand up and say, you bunch of sinners, you kill babies and you change the way we do marriage. He didn't, he's not that kind of a prophet at all. Uh, he addressed the matter indirectly with humor and stories. Why am I doing this? How did Nathan address David's sin? David, let me tell you a story. A man had a sheep. David's leaning forward and listening, and the net was about to be drawn. Metaxas, I think, is a genius in how he did this. People were laughing. I mean, you watch it. He's, he's all, it's like a comedian. He gives his... And it, anyway, I'm... I'm he did it indirectly through humor and stories. His theme was the difference between hypocritical religiosity and real faith. His examples were powerful and brought loud affirmations of praise from the audience. As he spoke, you could just sort of hear the, yeah, preach it, brother. It was, uh, as he said this, bullet one. Over 200 years ago, members of parliament almost all went to church, and yet they supported the African slave trade. And you could sort of hear, hear a gasp in the room like, yeah, those rotten hypocrites. You know, it's like he's just drawing them right into his net. Uh, this is my assumption. Then Wilberforce, uh, manifesting true faith, stood up and saved the day. And you could just sort of feel the room say, yeah, that was awful to treat blacks that way and slavery and go Wilberforce. Uh, and you could feel it on the platform behind him. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. Bullet two. Then there was Nazi Germany, and these were the books he wrote, of course, the one on William Wilberforce and Bonhoeffer. In Nazi Germany, many church-going Lutherans were supportive of Hitler's murderous hatred of the Jews. What hypocrisy! But Bonhoeffer, manifesting true faith, stood up and saved the day. And again, it was just sort of, yeah, that's awful to treat Jews that way. And we know that's bad and good for Bonhoeffer. It's like, where's he going? And what, what's he doing? And you just think he's sort of entertaining. Then comes the punchline. Metaxas asked, who do we say is not fully human today? Who is expendable to us? People used to say blacks. People used to say Jews. Is there anybody that's in that category today? And he answered his own question, the unborn. And there was suddenly, nobody was saying amen. <laughs> it suddenly got real uncomfortable in the room as he had, he had set the trap. He told a story. He made everybody laugh. But he was prophetic. He was prophetic. Uh, you, get the, you Google it and watch it. You, you draw your own conclusion. Uh, the unborn. No one... On the plat yeah, here's Nancy Pelosi said. I mean, they're all they're all just right there. You can see their faces as he's doing this. Um, no one on the platform was smiling or saying, "Preach it, brother." The only thing missing was for Metaxas to put his finger in Obama's chest and say, "Thou art the man," which is what Nathan did to David. Nathan set a trap, and he did it indirectly with a story. Metaxas did it with humor, but he was prophetic. I take my time to set that up because very often American evangelicals, we only think there's one way to address sin, and that's directly get in your face, say you're going to go to hell if you don't change. Do you hear me? And the people are just running for cover because they, it's, I don't know, we've, we need to be more strategic in our prophetic ministries. Are you, and I think Nathan is exhibit A. David, let me tell you about a story about a man who had a sheep. And David is leaning forward and listening and totally engaged. And then the finger's in his chest. David, you're the man. We'll read the story in a minute, okay? Uh, getting away with murder. Phew, that was close. A year has passed since what we studied last week. Since David brazenly broke four of the Ten Commandments, 
He coveted another man's wife. He committed murder, adultery, and false witness. It appeared he'd gotten away with it. There were no leaks, no investigations, and no special prosecutors appointed. <laughs> you know, there, this was Monica Gate, but it's like he got away with it. A year has passed. He got married, they had a baby, and it's like it's blown over. Perhaps David hoped that time would heal all wounds. And let me just say a lot of us fall into that trap. I did something, but if enough time elapses, it'll be okay. It's like not with sin. Sin does not go away. And if it's not dealt with in this world, it will be dealt with in the next. It's just it's there. And time does not heal all wounds. So let's read the story. Um, Second Chronicles, uh, Chronicles, <laughs> Second Samuel. All right, you ready to go? So a year has passed, and the Lord sent Nathan to David. Nathan came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city. See, he's very indirect. And you almost think, what's he doing? Is, is he wasting time? No, he's setting a trap. He's indirectly, like I think Metaxas did as a genius. There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little lamb, which he bought. And he brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. Isn't this a good story? Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his flock or herd to prepare a guest for a meal for the guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. There's the trap. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives... The man who's done this deserves to die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, and this is the line, You are the man. You've just condemned yourself. By your own standards, you've pronounced your own guilt. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would have added so much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord? To do what is evil in his sight. You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword. And, is take, and have taken his wife to be your wife. He doesn't even name her. But he names Uriah. You killed one of your soldiers. Your best friends. And took his wife. Now therefore, verse 10. The sword shall never depart from your house. Because you have despised me. And have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house. And I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor. Now in a few chapters we're going to learn who he's talking about. He's talking about his son Absalom. Who's going to rebel against his daddy. And to let everybody know 
that he's rebelled against his daddy. He pitches a tent on the top of the palace and one by one goes in with his daddy's concubines and sleeps with them. So the whole nation gets it. That's the prophecy. We'll see that in a week or so. Um, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. You did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. You know, the thing about Scripture is we have the words, we don't have the intonation. And when you read it, you need to be enough of an actor to say, what's the tone of the I have sinned? But uh, those are the words. I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord has put away your sin and you shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. Then Nathan went to his house. Anybody have the new King James or the King James on verse 15, verse 14? You want to read verse 14 to us. However, because of this deed, you have given great occasion to the enemy of the Lord to blaspheme his fire. Yeah. So there's a textual question here. The ESV reads, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord. But another way it's been translated is, by this deed you have given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. David, what are the Philistines going to say about this story? What are the Ammonites and the Moabites going to say? I know exactly what they're going to say. Yes, some God you serve, you say yourself a moral people, the Ten Commandments. Your king can't even keep them. And for centuries, your witness is ruined. Okay, let's see. Uh, I got way too much material, but let's see, let's see how far we get, all right? Um, here's just a few notes on the text. I, um, the ro Number one, under... Roman numeral 2b1, uh, the role of the prophet we see in this passage in confronting people, even kings, with their sins is of vital importance. To be effective, a prophet must have truth, timing, wise approach, clear message, and courage. But we, we could talk more about the role of the prophet, but we're not going to do that tonight. But that's a good one. Nathan is wise not to confront David directly and begin his message with a rebuke. Rather, he uses an indirect method. He tells David a story that appeals to his sense of justice. Think about some of the people you're burdened for and you try to witness to, and maybe the Holy Spirit can give you some very creative ideas about indirect maybe you've been trying the direct approach you know here read read this verse <laughs> you know just in your and sometimes that's appropriate but there's a lot of situations where we need to be like David and Metaxas just sort of wander in but get to the point there's a point uh, three you are the man I just loved this quote from Eugene Peterson the gospel is never about somebody else. That's a good line. It's always about you and me. The gospel is never a truth in general. It's always a truth in specific. You and me. Who you are and what you've done. Who I am and what I've done. Though the child born of David and Bathsheba's adulterous affair dies, a future child will be born, will be blessed of God and rule after David's death. What's his name? Solomon. Solomon. You got it. And we'll get to some of that story later, but we're obviously skipping some good parts. This is what I want to talk about tonight. Top of page two. What do you do with a guilty conscience? The biblical word that describes what a person feels when he's brought face to face, 
face to face with his sin is... I'm, I'm scaring you. Yeah, Conviction. At least that's the word I'm looking for. Conviction. It's a word I don't hear much anymore in the church. We used to hear it a lot. Uh, we used to feel it a lot. I can remember as a high schooler sitting on the back pew of the balcony, you know, just saying, when is this service going to get over? Why, why, and just, you know, that's conviction. That's conviction. I didn't know the word for it, but it's like, I don't like, I don't like what's happening here. It makes me very uncomfortable. Well, why does it make me uncomfortable? Well, it's because of what went on last weekend with my, when I was out. That's why I don't like it. Oh, you're feeling conviction. Suddenly, he or she is confronted with the shame, the guilt, and the sin in his life. It's painful. It hurts. The conscience has been pricked by a prophet or maybe a Bible verse or a memory or a worship service, and there's others. Conviction is one of the most important ministries of the Holy Spirit. John 16, Jesus is talking about the Comforter. And he says, when the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, comes, he will convict the world of sin. Conviction is similar to that annoying red light on the dashboard of your car. <laughs> I love uh, analogy. Word pictures help me. But uh, I used to have a, oh, a Ford uh, Fiesta. What was it? It was a clunker. But about... You know, twice a week, the red light would come on of the car. You know, just drive me crazy. It's like, what? and I would tend to ignore it. And I wanted to unplug it because it could just mess up your whole day. Man, I, the red light's on. Well, that's what conviction is. It can mess up your whole day. But the reality is, if it's true... And if the conviction is right, you better get off the highway and get in a garage quick, quick, or you're going to have what could be a minor problem become, you know, a, a major problem. It's a good thing when the light goes off on the dashboard of your car, but it never feels like a good thing. It's a good thing when the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin, although it can ruin your whole day. Convict... Uh, when it lights up, what? Well, yeah, that's what, a royal pain, a royal pain. I was pretty proud of that title for this sermon, actually. It's a good title. When he was convicted of sin, think of the things David could have done. And this is worth spending a little time on, although we're going to do it quickly. But so what do you do when you're convicted of sin? These are some of the options. One... David could have dismissed the concept of guilt. Nathan's put me on a guilt trip. Hear that guilt trip. In other words, what are you doing when you say it's a guilt trip? It means you shouldn't be feeling guilty just because you killed a man and took his wife. Come on, that's, he put you on a guilt trip. It's like, so dismiss the concept Two, big one, he could have justified his behavior. I'm the king. I can have any woman I want. And Uriah would have probably been killed in battle anyway. I mean, we're really good at this. Or three, rationalized his behavior. Other kings do this all the time. Besides, I really do love her, and I've prayed about it. This, this, is, this is real stuff. Don't, I, you know it as well as I do. Uh, he, four, he could have played the victim, the blame game. It's not my fault. Bathsheba was the one who took her clothes off in public so that I could see. Don't, we're good at this. Five, he could have ignored the warning. Great story, David. Hey, anybody hungry? Let's go get some wings and watch the game. That's what I would do when I was in the back row of the balcony growing up. You know, I just wanted to get out and just change the scenery. Because when I changed the scenery, then I got away from that 
annoying conviction. Let's just turn, on the, turn up the music or something. F- six, I like this one, he could have shot the messenger. But that's like disconnecting the wires to the warning light on your dashboard. <laughs> Um, and seven, he could have turned inward to find a solution for his guilt. And in some reason, I thought of Lady Macbeth and began to look up some of that story. I, know, I don't know much about Shakespeare, but there's some good stuff there. Lady Macbeth and her husband killed a man named Duncan. And Lady Macbeth tried to wash the blood off her hands. But in her imagination, it was always there. And in the middle of the night, she would pace the floors of the palace, washing her hands. She's, but again, she's trying to deal with her own guilt. In Psalm 51, we're going to see where David tries to deal with his guilt by going to God. Big difference, whether you talk to God about your guilt or whether you talk to yourself about your guilt. Lady Macbeth paces the castle in the middle of the night, unable to sleep because of her guilty conscience. She imagines the blood from her murderous deeds still on her hands, so she washes them. She's obsessive-compulsive. And her famous quote, out damned spot. I didn't curse when I said that. That's a good way to describe that spot. And it's a good way to describe what that spot will do, that murderous blood stain. Okay? So what did David do? We've been looking at the possible ways to respond to conviction. But what did he do? And I just read the story, and let me just try to recreate it. A, he let conviction do its work. When David, when Nathan said, stuck his finger in his chest and said, David, you're the man. David basically said, I know. That's pretty remarkable, actually, especially when you're the king and you could have said off with his head. He received it. David realized that his feelings of guilt were not the result of a neurotic conscience or the manipulation of a zealous prophet. No, it was the Holy Spirit of God who was exposing the true condition of his heart. He recognized the difference between conviction and condemnation. I think I was in my 40s before I knew how to say that. (laughs) Romans 8.1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. But it doesn't say there is therefore now no conviction for those who are in Christ Jesus. Those are two separate things. As soon as, as, soon as you say it, you say, any idiot knows that. But I'm not just any idiot. You know, it takes me a while to catch on to these things. I, and we confuse it. Conviction's a good thing. Condemnation is a bad thing. But David received the conviction. He let it work in his life. B, he confessed the truth. The word confess in the Greek language uh, literally means to say the same thing, to agree with. So if the prophet says you're a sinner, David says, I agree. That's what confession is. If the Holy Spirit says, you're a sinner. If I confess my sins, I say I agree. I don't rationalize. I don't justify. I don't blame. I just say guilty is charged. It's true. I have sinned, David said. No excuses, rationalizations, justifications, explanations, blaming someone else or shooting the messenger. Three words. Simple, to the point, and true. I have sinned. But are these words authentic? When I read those words a while ago, when Nathan says, 
you're the man, and David says, I have sinned. How many of you felt a bit of cynicism? And it's like, do you remember when Bill Clinton said he had done wrong with Monica? You know, now I'm, um, it's like the cynicism in me is so deep with politicians these days, especially on apologies. It's like, I don't believe anybody anymore. There's such cynicism in my heart. Can we, how do we know we can believe David? If you want to do an interesting study, study in Scripture the people who said those three words, I have sinned. It's a very interesting list. Here, here they are, or at least a beginning list. Pharaoh. <laughs> <laughs> I, and I, I'm very cynical about that, but twice he said, and the, pla- the plagues are destroying his nation. And so Moses comes in and Pharaoh says to Moses, tell your God I've sinned, you know. But as soon as the plague went away, Pharaoh hardened his heart again. Like that, he didn't mean it. How do we know David means it? Or Balaam. Balaam was a rascal. He's the guy with the talk, talking donkey. Uh, Achan. The blank there, more importantly, is King Saul, who was David's mentor. Saul once, twice said, I have sinned, but he didn't mean it. And the last blank Anybody know who in Matthew 27, 4 said, I have sinned? Judas. They're good words, but how do we know Judas didn't mean it or it wasn't true confession? Because he went out and hung himself. True confession always leads to hope and to life. False confession leads to death. True repentance and false repentance. So how do we know that David's confession is for real? Because, see, he also repented. And he experienced God's redeeming grace. Nathan says, the Lord has put away your sin. We're going to talk more about that in just a moment when we turn to Psalm 51. But let me say one more thing before we get there. D, he recognized that even forgiven sin often has tragic consequences. And in the next few weeks, we're going to see the consequences. And even though David is forgiven and restored... The damage from Bathsheba Gate haunts him till his dying day. This is troubling. And most of us don't want to believe this part of the gospel. That don't be deceived. God is not mocked. What you sow, you reap. And even forgiven sin can have consequences, all right? For example, for our family, and this is the mega place, David's family, if you want to study dysfunctional families, you will not do better in any psychology course than to just take the book of Samuel and study the family of David. Unless you want to maybe study in the book of Genesis the study of the family of Abraham, who was pretty dysfunctional too. And I love that about the Bible. It doesn't hide these realities. But for David, his family problem started. And it starts in the next chapter when Amnon, David's son, rapes his sister. And then Absalom, David's son, kills his brother and then rebels against his father. It's like, Talk about a messed up family. Everybody here has better families than, than this greatest saint of the Old Testament. It's like, but it came out of Bathsheba Gate. 
Um, number two, it has tragic consequences for our witness to unbelievers. By this deed, you've given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. And three, it has tragic consequences for the innocent. The child dies. It's like the kid didn't do anything. Why does he have to die for David's shenanigans? That's sort of how it works. I don't know that I've got an answer. It's just sin has terrible consequences. Even... Forgiven sin. Sort of quiet right now. Yes, this is. Let's turn. We got 15 minutes. And let's look at Psalm 51. And see how David. Worked it out. This is where David. And I, that's the only way I noticed. He just worked it out with God. <laughs> um. We don't have really any information on how he worked it out with Bathsheba or Uriah or the others. I'd like, I've got some unanswered questions on that. David, you owe an apology not just to God, but you've sinned against some others too. And we don't have a lot of data on that. But at least in Psalm 51, we've got one of the most amazing passages in all the Bible. And let me read it. Uh, you see the title. To the choir master. A psalm of David. When Nathan the prophet went to him. After he had gone into Bathsheba. So here's David working it out. Have mercy on me, O God. According to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. And, and watch for the verbs. They're very strong. Blot out. It's not just cover it up. Blot it out. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. And cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart, purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. 
Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then will you delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings, and whole burnt offerings, and then bulls will be offered on your altar. In few other places of Scripture will you find a more eloquent testimony to two things. To the hideous power of sin and the glorious power of grace. So you got two things going on here. Sin is really, really, really bad. And grace is really, 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 really good. That's the gospel. And you're seeing it here. And it's troubling on both counts. How can we be so bad? How can God be so good? This is it. And David's just working it out. And when I wrote this, this is how my mind works. My mind goes back to this old hymn, Beneath the Cross of Jesus. Do you remember this phrase? And from my stricken heart with fears, two wonders I confess. Just two things. The wonders of redeeming love and the wonder of my unworthiness. I'm just, I can't get beyond that. How messed up and wicked and egocentric I am and how gracious God is. Haunted by the memory of what he had done. Um, Yeah, I think, and I think it's in the movie Amazing Grace. John Newton, who wrote the hymn Amazing Grace, is talking to uh, Wilberforce, and he says the line, and I I don't know where it comes in written, but he says, "I, I am a great sinner. But Jesus is a great Savior. It's like those, that, those two realities. The greatness of sin. The greatness of grace. Haunted by the memory of what he has done. David doesn't talk to himself like Lady Macbeth. Rather he talks to God. That's a pretty good point right there. Lady Macbeth. Stop wandering the hallways talking to yourself. Get on your knees and talk to God. There's hope for murderers, but not if you just talk to yourself and keep washing your hands. He prays, he sings, he writes a psalm. Unlike most contemporary superficial, this may be the key word tonight, understandings of sin and grace. It's not that Most of us are wrong in what we think about sin and grace. We're shallow. And this psalm psalm takes us deep. Rather than dissecting, analyzing, and diagramming this psalm, let's allow its four main themes to penetrate our minds and hearts. So let me just, this is my four-point sermon. Um, I've actually preached it, uh, but this, this is good. I'm just going to give it to you. And it's all deep. A is deep sin. This psalm introduces us through David that however bad you think you are, you're a whole lot worse than you think you are. <laughs> Your sin is the disease is worse than you think it is. And it, the summary verse is David saying, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. David is not suggesting that his birth was the result of his parents' sin. He's saying that there is something at the core of his being that is rotten. I choose my words. <laughs> it's just there's... You've heard me, Shakespeare again, there's something rotten in Denmark, but there's something rotten in Stan. And when I get deep inside and look at it, it's, it's, 
It's not pretty. Did you read my blog that I wrote about my wife on filters? That spoke to me. Uh, Katie, in her stroke, it was like all her conscious filters were sort of taken away. And it was like she was the beautiful person she always is, thinking of others, praying. And I said, man, if all the filters were taken off me, I'm so afraid of what would come out. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure what's there. That's, it's scary. Um, where am I at here? Yeah, um, there's something rotten, out of alignment. And I love, it's when you're, the front tires on your car are out of a line, you'll go in the ditch every time. Now, if you concentrate really hard and pay attention all the time, you can maybe avoid disaster. But as soon as you relax, the default, boom, you're, that's the human heart. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. What's wrong? Lord, what's wrong with my heart? It's not my hands. David's hands and other body organs, to be crude, got him into trouble. But that's not what's bothering David in this psalm. Lord, it's my heart that the problem is. My external actions are just a manifestation of the rottenness inside. Uh, there are some verses. You can look them up. This introduces us to the doctrine of total depravity. I love, or sometimes called original sin. I love what G.K. Chesterton said about the doctrine of total depravity. <laughs> he said, yeah, it is the most unpopular of all the Christian doctrines, but it's the most, but it's the most easy to prove. <laughs> and I would say, if you want proof, just visit the toddler nursery in any church. And you'll see, and it's uh, mine, 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 mine. <laughs> Do you remember Finding Nemo, the movie, and the seagulls? Anyway, you, sorry. You, I tell, give illustrations that don't work sometimes. But in the movie Finding Nemo, there are seagulls. And they're always saying, mine, 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 mine. And they're going for the fish. That's mine, mine. Well, that's the human heart. It's all about me. It's mine, mine. Go in a nursery is where you see it in its raw form. The real problem is not what I do, but who I am. Today, when people say the sinner's prayer, and think about those four, little, four spiritual laws booklets, and when we get the privilege of saying to someone, Are you, would you like to say the sinner's prayer? It's not that we're doing something wrong, but when we look back on it, it's like, I didn't have a clue what I was saying when I said, Lord, I'm a sinner. I did not have a clue. I thought I did, but when, today when people say the sinner's prayer, they typically have a very superficial understanding of sin. It goes something like this, Lord, I'm really a decent person, but occasionally I do bad things. David's prayer He's coming to grips with the fact that, Lord, I am a low-down, no-good, dirty, rotten bum. I learned that line from Tim Philpott, by the way. <laughs> you preached on that, and I've kept it. Every, it's just a great line. It, it's, and occasionally I do some good things. But the default setting in my human heart is sin. David realized realizes that he is not a sinner because he sins, but he sins because he's a sinner. That's so important, I'm going to say it again. We're not, sin, we're not, we don't commit sins, excuse me, we don't, I got to read it. I'm not a sinner because I sin. I sin because I'm a sinner. And most of us don't realize that when we first come to Christ. All we realize is I've done some stupid things. And I'm sort of embarrassed about it. And I don't want to go to hell. It's like, okay, we can start there. 
That's a good place to start, but don't end there. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can understand it? That's Jeremiah. Rather, um, therefore, I need more than clean hands. I need a clean heart. David's prayer is not saying, Lord, help me wash my hands. He's saying, Lord, if I wash my hands, I'm going to go out and do the same stupid stuff again if my heart's not changed. I need more than forgiveness. I need cleansing. I need more than release from the guilt of sin. I need victory over the power of sin. I need more than God to do something for me. I need God to do something in me. I need more than justification. I need sanctification. I need more than Calvary. I need Pentecost. Those two columns are wonderful. <laughs> Those two columns are wonderful. And that's what David is discovering in Psalm 51. It's not just my hands, Lord. My sin is deeper than I ever knew it was. Uh, how many of you know the Book of Common Prayer? I know Susie uses it. I know she does in her church. And this prayer was in our, um, in our United Methodist hymnal growing up. I, can, I could almost quote it from memory. It's a little different. And, uh, but I don't think it's in most church traditions. But it's a prayer that I really miss this prayer because it... Every time you pray it, you just sort of wince. Like, these, these words are, <laughs> are incredible. And it's Thomas Cranmer, 400 years ago. L let's read these words together, okay? We're about to wind up, but this, this is still worth getting. I want you to read it with me. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men, knowledge and bewail our manifold sins and wickedness, which we from time to time most grievously have committed by thought, word, and deed against thy divine majesty, provoking most justly an indignation against us. We do earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for these our misdoings. The remembrance of them is grievous unto us. The burden of them is intolerable. Have mercy upon us, have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. For thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may ever hear and please thee in newness of life to the honor and glory of thy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. I miss that. Those words are just, uh, it's like, I'm coming to grips with something. Real quickly, let me give you the last three. We've talked about in Psalm 51, David is coming to grips with deep sin. B, with deep repentance. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me, cleanse me, purge me, deliver me. He's not just saying, forgive me so I can go to heaven when I die. That, there's a place for that prayer. But when you get to David's place, you're at deep repentance. Lord, it's not just what I've done, it's who I am. David's grief over what happened goes much deeper than sorrows for his actions. He realizes that he needs much more than forgiveness for his deeds. Unless his heart is transformed, he might repeat the same shenanigans again. Therefore, David's repentance is not just for the beastly things he's done, but for the beastly person he is. Lord, the real problem is not so much what I've done, it's who I am. I love this line. You can hose a pig down and make him clean, but unless his pig nature is changed, he'll go right back and wallow in the mud. And the gospel says... God wants to change your pig nature. 
He doesn't just want to hose you down. It's nice to get hosed down. But if I just go back to the pigsty, it's like, is that the point? Is that why Jesus died? And you get to where finally like David, and you say, Lord, is there more? Can you change my pig nature? There's a great lines from Charles Wesley. I'm going to skip, but they're good. C is deep grace. We've talked about deep sin, deep repentance, but now the good stuff, deep grace. Create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit. David is asking God to transform his inner being, change his nature. The word create is used only of something that God can do. When David says create, in the Bible, there's only one subject for the verb create. God creates. Men and women make things, but they don't create things in the Bible. Create is when God does something. So, Lord, I can't fix my heart. And as soon as I say that, I almost hear God lean over the ramparts of heaven and saying, it's about time. <laughs> it's about time you caught on to that. No, you can't change your heart, but I can. I, God, can. Uh, though many think of conversion as behavior modification. And most would deny it, but that is close to what is preached in many evangelical churches. Change your behaviors. Change your behaviors. Well, a good psychology book talks about that. The gospel is not about behavior modification, at least alone. David now realizes that his need goes much deeper than that. The good news of the gospel is that where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Yes, sin goes deep, but grace goes deeper still. Yeah, David, you are a murderous, adulterous bum. But God loves you anyway. And I'm, I'm sort of screaming inside and saying, are you, really? Is that how it works? Then I look in the mirror, and I'm glad that's how it works. D is deep faith. David realizes that his heart is cleansed in the same way that his hands are washed. By God's grace alone, not by works, through faith alone. Some think we're justified by faith, but sanctified by works. That is a heresy, frankly. Wow, that was a lot. I think you were pretty attentive tonight. This was, a, this was heavy stuff. This is good stuff. Very, con very convicting. Very convicting. Hey, let me lead us in prayer, okay? Um, maybe just to create a, just a brief moment of silence here to give each of us, Lord, the chance in the quietness of our own hearts. Just like Quentin said, it's convicting. So just a few moments of silence for you to quietly talk to God about what he's saying to you tonight. Where sin abounded, grace abounded even more. Lord, thank you tonight for this troubling story and how it is not just history, it's not just theology, it's our story. And Lord, would you take what we've been studying and talking about and help each of us apply it and where the Holy Spirit is convicting us of sin, would we learn to do what David did and not justify or rationalize or blame or shoot the messenger, but we would receive it and allow your spirit to take us deeper, to understand deep sin, 
deep repentance, deep grace, and deep faith. It's good stuff. Minister to our souls even as we sleep tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.